Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from interest.co.nz and welcome to another of our double shot interviews where we bring someone interesting in to talk about things of interest to us here at Interest. <laughs> and we have Grant Robertson, the Labour Party's finance spokesman, here to talk about the economy and interest rates. We love talking about interest <laughs> rates. Uh, Grant, um, what do you think is going wrong or right with the economy at the moment? Um, given actually, you know, we've got two and a half percent growth, maybe three percent if you believe the Reserve Bank, and no inflation. Seems, sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, one can look at numbers like that and make up whatever story you like. Uh, what I think is is going well in the economy at the moment is you know, we're seeing tourism getting back from what wasn't too good a time um, a decade or so back, but you know, picking up now. Um, clearly, um, we've seen some growth in, in ICT and those sorts of areas. But when you look at the real growth figures, the per capita growth figures, we're barely making any movement whatsoever. You know, we've seen a decline in, in real um, disposable income. So actually, as a country, we can, we can look at ourselves and compare ourselves to the rest of the world on per capita growth. It's not such a pretty story. Then we've got what happens to New Zealand in terms of the post Canterbury rebuild. Uh, we've got a huge boom potentially coming in the construction sector in Auckland if we get that right. But then we're going to have a very uneven period of growth. I mean, we've seen most of the jobs in the last few years in Canterbury and Auckland. And with the dairy decline, which is clearly a major problem for the New Zealand economy, we can see that risk again of regional economies sliding further backwards. Auckland struggling under its own weight and Canterbury no longer <laughs> providing that work. So I don't want to be the doomsday scenario guy, but I think the New Zealand economy is sluggish. And I think that at the moment, the next couple of years look to me like ones where that per capita growth isn't going to go anywhere unless we change some of the settings. So there seem to, we seem to have a productivity problem. Yeah. We're able to pump in more resources, more people, more working hours, more mm. stuff to get more stuff out. But actual <laughs> production per person per hour is just not growing that fast. What would a Labor government do differently to change that? Yeah, and, and it is a long-term problem. I mean, that's, you know, I don't want to totally put that down to the current government. Um, our productivity hasn't been good for a long time. It's, it's got a multifaceted solution. Um, research and development is a huge part of this. We simply have too little being invested both by a public sector and private sector in, in the things that will actually take productivity to the next level, and that is about leading on innovation. So we've clearly got to address that. R&D tax credits are part of that, giving the private sector the confidence that they actually can invest in that area. And that's not part of the Labor Policy Review, the R&D tax credits? It's straight up, it's still there, and I cannot see it changing in any way, shape or form. We're happy to look at you know, around the margins of how it actually gets implemented. But I think, and the feedback I've had as I've gone around the business community, is the certainty that's provided by those versus the grant scheme. There'll still be some element of grant schemes, of course, in research and development, but, but no, businesses knowing they can invest there is really important to me. But then the government's got its side of the coin as well. How do we get better value out of our Crown Research Institutes? How do we make sure that we've got better connections between university research and commercial research? All of that, that picture will help, um, you know, I think, drive us a bit further forward in innovation. Equally though, we've got to use the levers that are open to us. I don't think we do enough in terms of how government procurement works to support New Zealand firms. I think we can change some of the rules and settings there to ensure that the government's playing its part. Uh, I think we can support the growth of, of new businesses better through seed investment funding. Um, you know, we have quite a good venture investment fund if you're a large business, not so good if you're a slightly smaller business. So there's a host of things that we can do to start supporting uh, investment. Ex accelerated depreciation is another one that comes up constantly from businesses saying, if we can just get ourselves going, that'll start to improve our productivity. And then is the overall adoption of technology, which we've been looking at through our, our Future of Work project. So there is a host of different ways that the government could be involved. I think philosophically it does actually come down to whether or not the government is an active partner in the economy or a bit of a bystander. Um, and occasionally Stephen Joyce dips his toe in the water of, 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 of giving out a grant here or a contract there. But actually being an active partner in the economy is vital to improving that productivity. What about migration, which uh, has supplied 67,000 extra people into the economy, mm -hmm. many of them workers, often uh, working at minimum wage jobs. What would Labor do about migration? Yeah, look, we have to be able to moderate and modulate the flow of migration 
depending on economic circumstances. And that is actually the heart of the policy we have now, that you know, we've never had open borders. We've never said just, well, in, in modern times, we've never had open borders. We've never said just come in. I think we've got a bit of a misalignment going on between what is genuinely a skilled migration program and what we have right now. And we also have the huge number of international students coming in, and that number is that 67,000 number has been propped up by an ever increasing number of international students. I want to know that they're here for good quality programs, um, and I think there's a bit of work to do in there. So Would Labor look to reverse that change from October 2013, where it allowed foreign students to work during yeah. term time? Um, I think we would want to have another look at that. Uh, I'm not convinced that, that we can say no work at all, because for some people, even as an international student, that is an important part of being able to be here. But I think extending those hours out has clearly um, seen, seen more people come. I'm more worried about the courses that are actually just straight out fronts and are not, in fact, about quality education at all, but are actually about people coming here to work. Which ones? Well, there are some courses the NZQA has been looking at, and, and I think there may be more to come in that area. Um, I'm not saying every program's like that, but I do think we need to be absolutely sure that people are here for educational purposes. But look, that's only one aspect of, of, of the overall immigration issue. We want immigration to be about supporting where there are skill gaps and where New Zealand can genuinely lift its productive productivity and its performance on the back of people coming here. That will mean from time to time being a bit more careful and a bit more um, sophisticated with the kind of um, policy settings we've got in the immigration area. The really important thing for New Zealand is that we do not confuse the discussion between immigration and race. When we do that, we lose the ability as a country to have the conversation we need to have. They are two separate issues. Uh, the other um, topic at the moment is interest rates, uh, and particularly the Reserve Bank surprise cut um, on March the 10th. Uh, um, what do you think about the Reserve Bank's performance versus its policy targets agreement? Well, it's clearly not meeting its policy targets agreement, and I have said on a number of occasions now that that now needs to be reviewed. Uh, there is no point in having a, a target or a midpoint that you don't even look to meet over the so-called medium term. The redefinition of the medium term is one of the great you know, changes in, 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 in the minclature and monetary policy. We, we, you know, we've got um, Bill English and Graham Wheeler both saying that this is monetary policy is set for how you control inflation, not how you pump it up. Um, well, if that's a problem, and it looks like it's a reasonably long-term problem, then we've got to relook at monetary um, policy to be able to say, how do we use it to not only control inflation, but support overall monetary policy, which from time to time may see you wanting to pump inflation up a little bit. If you to answer your question about the performance of the bank, look, I think there is a real concern here that we're a bit behind the eight ball. Everybody knows there's another cut coming this year. There might be a second one after that. Um, we're not, you know, we're not successfully lowering the value of the dollar through these cuts. There's small, you know, small dip in the exchange rate that got pumped straight back up again a week later. So there are problems with our settings in monetary policy, and we do need to relook at it. So what would a policy targets agreement under yeah. a Labor government? You'd be, if you were finance minister, you'd be the one signing the. Yeah, and, I, and and look, you know, we've got to sit down and talk that through with the Reserve Bank governor. I, I am still a supporter of an independent monetary policy. I think, I think that, that the government can help create these settings, but in the end we, we are well served by, by the independence of the Reserve Bank, so it will be a, a genuine conversation. I've said often before I think it is possible for the Reserve Bank to have a mandate beyond just controlling inflation. I think if it had had a mandate around employment we wouldn't have seen the rates go up when they did and we might have seen them come down a little bit quicker. So. I've been clear before I'd like to see something like an employment based or an overall health of the economy based target included within the PTA. On inflation itself, you know, this is where we've got to sit down and have a genuine conversation with a range of experts involved about what is the future of inflation. Um, it's a big topic and I know the Reserve Bank Governor is concerned about it himself. So, you know, there would be some change. I could see a broadening of the criteria, and we do have to look at how we how inflation is measured and what it means in the economy. 
So the Reserve Bank could cut interest rates, do whatever it wants, and then the banks might not pass it on. So <laughs> what, what do you think the banks yeah, should do well, about it? Because well, they haven't passed on all of the No, they have not, pressure. although they were very, very quick to cut um, savings rates. So um, clearly on that side of the ledger, they responded quickly. Look, that is, you know, it was the Reserve Bank Governor who said very clearly at the Parliamentary Select Committee I was at that he expected the rate to be passed on, the rate cut to be passed on. It wasn't. I understand that there has been an increase in the cost of borrowing overseas for banks, but I also don't think that that increase um, legitimises not passing on the cut, and it does start to neuter the value of monetary policy. Uh, that's a conversation for, for me as Finance Minister to have with the Reserve Bank Governor as well, is does he have the tools in his toolbox that makes him comfortable that, that the value of him, of him setting an official cash rate uh, is still there, and we'll have that conversation, but that's not... That's not to say that we would determine those rates, but it is to say that we need some pretty serious conversations with the banks about what they're doing. Would Labor go as far as looking to regulate retail interest rates? Uh, I'm reluctant to say that. Um, I think that what we would do is talk to the bank, the Reserve Bank Governor about the tools that he has. I mean, the, the, the overall relationship between the trading banks and the Reserve Bank is one that you know, has a number of different levers within it. And I think that's probably the place to go looking for, for whether or not you can, you know, you can assure New Zealanders they should, they'll get the value that they should from an OCR cut. But uh, though that is the primary relationship, the governor to the trading banks, um, the government's there to set the rules, not be involved in the middle of that. Grant Robertson, the finance spokesman for Labour, talking about interest rates. Is there anything more fun than that? <laughs> I'm Bernard Hickey for interest.co.nz.